Welcome back for another episode. This is your host, AJ Amjek, and today we are going to be talking about why acupuncturists fail. And to shed some light on this topic, I have brought on Lorne Brown. He gives us much insight to his super successful 16-year career and introduces his new book, Missing the Point, Why Acupuncturists Fail and What They Need to Know to Succeed. So let's get in today's episode. This is the Acupuncturist on Fire podcast. The only acupuncture podcast where you will hear from business insiders, fellow acupuncturists, and be inspired to be the best acupuncturist you can be. Now, here's your host, AJ Adamchik. Hi, right, Lauren. So excited for you to be here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, AJ. Oh, it's so great. How's all the weather over there in Vancouver? You know, it's hit or miss. It's been a pretty sunny time for us in Vancouver, so we've been doing well, but we're always going to get rain. So if there's parts of the states that need some water, we'll build a pipeline and ship it out to you guys. Oh, man. <laughs> no shortage of it's, water. Here. It's crazy. Over here in New Jersey, we've had like, for Christmas, it was 65 degrees here for Christmas, which was out of the control. Usually it's snowing uh, or like, uh, you know, today it's pretty chilly out here. Actually, it's sunny but cold. But it's been such a warm winter. It's been oh, crazy. Like I, I think on Christmas Day I ran with shorts and a t-shirt on, which was you know crazy. And I don't know. It's who knows what's going on with this weather in this in this area on the northern northeast hemisphere, right? Considering what you've had the last couple of years, it's nice that you're having a little bit milder uh, winter. Yeah. Well, that you know, three years ago we got hit by Sandy right here directly. Like my town was probably one of the largest hit by Superstorm Sandy. I don't know if. Over there, you guys heard all about that. I'm sure you did. It was a pretty world known thing. And I mean, some of the areas, some areas aren't even still built up, which is crazy. Right. No, here the weather is pretty consistent. The beautiful thing about Vancouver, British Columbia is um, when we get snow, it's on our mountains. So we go to the mountains to ski, but the city usually doesn't have snow. So. Really? Yeah. All, even when it snows, it you really don't get it in the exact city. We're like Seattle. We're very similar to Seattle's weather. It's kind of a, uh, it never gets really, it never gets too hot or too cold here. It's kind of just a nice, good temperature. How far are you from uh, Seattle? It's a two hour drive. Okay. Not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. All right. So for the listener, tell the listener a little bit about yourself, you know, your business, how you got into acupuncture and, uh, you know, get it, let us know who you are. Sounds good. So um, my name is Lauren Brown. I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine. Now, in a past life, I was a chartered accountant, what's called a CPA, and um, I had health issues, and uh, the conventional didn't work, so I finally came across Chinese medicine, and it, it changed my life so much that eventually um, I resigned. I was a controller tax guy for the ocean spray growers here in British Columbia. Um, I resigned and went back to school to become a doctor of Chinese medicine, awesome. um, and then I fell into, my goal was to do, like, digestive IBS, Crohn's colitis. However, um, I had some fertility patients come to me and one of them had seen Randine Lewis, who's the author of The Infertility Cure. And um, Randine became my mentor and then my practice, which is called AccuBalance, AccuBalance Wellness Center in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, it became a reproductive Chinese medicine integrative clinic. And uh, I have six associates at the time of this recording. And we treat all kinds of women's health, gynecology. We're famously known for treating women, though, who are trying to get pregnant for infertility or um, during their pregnancy. Awesome. That's amazing. So tell us, you know, before we even dive in, you know, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, finding that mentor, because that's really one of the like, biggest principles uh, with Acumentress on Fire is, you know, a mentor, finding someone that helps you grow and, and see that person that shows you the way, you know, speeding up the process of learning. You know, the mentor is key. When I was in business and as a chartered accountant, I had business mentors and I acknowledged them. I have a book called Missing the Point, Why Acupunctures Fail and What They Need to Know to Succeed. And the first section of the book, I'm thanking my mentors that I had both in business and that I had in Chinese medicine. And so a mentor is, is, is incredibly important and it will... Um, It'll take you to another level in life in general, whatever your what your focus is. So if you can find a mentor, um, somebody that can help you um, teach teach you, um, then it will do a lot for your practice because that's something that's missing in Chinese medicine. In, in the medical system, conventional medicine, it's kind of structured that there's this mentorship. There's a, always a senior doctor 
and then you have the junior doctors. And in Chinese medicine, uh, the schools graduate us, and then what kind of patients come to us? Not the ones with the common cold. We get people that have very chronic, serious conditions because allopathic maybe has not worked, and here we are on our own as new grads trying to treat that. Um, and as I mentioned, I was fortunate that Randine Lewis, and it was no, um, it, it came to me, right? I didn't go looking for Randine. It just so happened by luck that the patient um, came to me and was seeing Randine in Houston. And Randine said, you need to find somebody locally. Um, but um, later on, when I eventually opened up Pro-D Seminars, the continued education for acupuncturists, um, because I get to meet so many speakers, I've, I've got great mentors. So, you know, when I have a tough case, um, you know, with if it's a fertility case, there's people like um, the ABRM group I'm a part of, Ray Rubio, Brandon Horn, Randine Lewis, Jane Littleton, I can call it, Pregnancy, Claudia Sikovitz, um, Deborah Betts, Heiner Fuhoff for herbal stuff, Sharon Weisenbaum for anything. So if you ever look at my cell phone and you go into my contact list, um, I have incredible mentors because I have that reach. For the practitioner, you got to be conscious and you got to look for somebody, somebody that you've that inspires you, maybe published, and you just reach out. You know, you have the right to ask, and they have the right to say no. Um, so, but you can't get there unless you ask. Yes. Um, specifically for the mentor, if you, I, I'll give you advice. Um, just because uh, I know for your podcast, you want some good clinical pearls, right? So, yeah, exactly. It's I mean, this is what it's all about: is this type of stuff right now. Learning from people like you, uh, a name in the business that people want to hear from, and exactly like you said, like you know, you're rolling off these names but you know as we grow and and put our information out there is just like pro d seminars you know acupuncture on fire was born to help others within this right. field you know well here here's a tip for mentors and it started when i was in chinese medicine school uh, one of my teachers that i i just adored he was great and uh, and still is great and i wanted to pick his brain more and um, i had just i had graduated and I asked if he would come to my clinic um, to see some of my difficult patients that I was having and, um, and I wanted to pay him. Now, how I asked him first is I said, can I take you out for lunch? So I took him out for lunch and I bought him lunch, talked about what I wanted to do and see if he'd be willing to help me with some of my difficult patients. This was my first six months of practice um, back in 2000. And one of the comments he said is, you're the first student that I have met with that has ever picked up the bill for lunch. So whenever students would invite him out for lunch, they got him to pay. And so, so just to let you know, if you want something from somebody, you got to create value for them, and you got to be kind to them, and makes gives. I guess there's got to be a little something in it for them. So to ask somebody, hey, can you help me? And then, um, um, you know, you should offer to take them out for lunch. That would be a good a good step because people are busy. Yeah. And th and then I paid him the fee I got. So I thought it was an investment. I was fine. I didn't share it. I gave him 100% of what the patient paid me for. There was about five patients I had him see. And I gave him 100% of it because I looked at that as an investment in myself because they'll continue to see me, hopefully, and I'm learning um, how to help them. And um, the question may come up, well, won't the patient lose confidence in you? Well, I came across as confident to my patient and I was honest too. There are certain things I could help, but I said, you know, this is a complex. I'd like to bring in a second opinion, one of my mentors. Would you like that? And they thought that was great. Oh my God, two eyes. So I had trust with the patient. I brought in my mentor. My mentor and I worked together. I, I, I wasn't sitting there like um, somebody who didn't know anything. I was involved in the conversation, but he was definitely leading the conversation. He gave some tips, some I agreed with, um, a lot I agreed with, but at the, with the patient, I was sitting there, they could see I understand, and they liked, They didn't understand exactly what he was talking about, yeah. but I understood the Chinese medicine lingo, and they continued to see me, knowing that I actually had the opinion of a more experienced practitioner giving me advice. So I took him out for lunch, I paid for his lunch, and I gave him my fee, and I didn't pretend to the patient I knew more than I really knew. I was there showing them that I had my limits, and I'm going to get that extra information from an experienced practitioner so I can treat you even better. Yeah, you're willing to go the extra mile for that patient too. You know, that that thing that, you know, a lot of patients, I'll sometimes right in the middle of an office, like right in the middle of the visit, I'll say, listen, you know, this is a case that, you know, is, is giving me difficulty or whatever it is. You know, I'm going to get a second opinion. I'm going to reach out to people that are have had 20, 30, 40 years of experience in this field and get the answer. Then we can bring it into this office 
you know, and get the answer. You know, I'm 29 years old. I'm not a, a seasoned professional that's been around forever, but I am as confident. I'm confident and I'll go get the answer. So it shows that you're willing to go above and beyond for that patient. And I think they like that more than just you sitting there saying you have all the answers and not willing to do that and go that extra mile for them. A hundred percent. And what that demonstrates when you say you go the extra mile, you're communicating to the patients you care. Because at the end of the day, we all, especially our patients, want to know that you really care about them. And going the extra mile, this is what we're famous for at AccuBalance. They know that if we don't have the answers, we will find the answer. We will dig and we'll ask other colleagues or other professions. And that's, I mean, I've been in practice. We're recording this in 2016, so I'm in my 16th year of practice. That's awesome. And I have sometimes patients call me saying, I don't think you treat this, but I was told by my friend to call you because you would be able to tell me who could treat this, right? So we're known at AccuBalance that we, we're diggers. And that's from my background as a CPA because I used to be an auditor. So I love to dig. We're always looking for that underlying cause and going that extra mile. So I love that you go the extra mile. And I can tell you right now, you'll be successful because patients want somebody that cares and going the extra mile shows you care. There's lip service. I do patient-centered care. I care about you. That's lip service. Going the extra mile and they see that you do things outside of the ordinary, um, that demonstrates that you care. And your actions will speak much more than just saying you do patient-centered care. Yeah, exactly. I completely agree with you. And you know, not to get off this topic, I want to go back to the mentor thing, and which is so funny of how like you know you reached out and found these mentors. And and I've always, you know, probably I've recorded 30 to 40, maybe even 50 interviews so far for this. And, you know, a lot of them have been centered around a mentor and, and finding that person and, or vice versa, talking to that other person of how they found their mentor and stuff. And, you know, one of the interviews I did was uh, with a fellow named Chad Bong. And sure. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a sports medicine acupuncturist uh, out of Philadelphia. And he's, his mentor is Whitfield Reeves, um, you know, uh, a famous, he authored uh, the sports medicine handbook and very famous sports medicine book. And he said he pretty much just nagged and nagged him until he pretty much said, all right, you know, this is what you're going to do. And then finally, you know, he's literally the co-author of his book with him. His name yeah. is on the front cover of his book. And, you know, it's funny. I said, I took a course with Chad. It was just a two day, you know, assessment type thing, sports medicine assessment, you know, uh, elbows, knees, shoulders, hips, you know, assessing the right thing of understanding where we are and everything. And I pretty much just said, you know, let me learn from you. I, you know, so every once in a while I'll email, call them or text them and be like, come on. So when are we, when are we learning to get, you know, when am I going to get the learn? And he's very like still reluctant of it because he doesn't, <laughs> he almost doesn't feel in a way like he's worthy of it yet to be right. that, to be the mentor rate. Right. You know, he's almost reluctant to it, but he's putting together some courses that I think I'm going to go work with him. But the one-on-one -on -one thing of really being that person to show the way he feels he's not that person that's right for it yet. Yeah, no. And I've heard of Chad and, and Whit I know well. I've studied with Whit myself oh, when I did awesome. sports medicine. And Whit and I are in discussion. So check out in the near future. You may see him on Pro D as well. Awesome. I would if you ever have the chance, I mean, if you're, you know, are close with him, I'd love a connection. I mean, Chad could probably connect, but um with you, Definitely. I mean, through that, you know, I'd love to maybe interview him for this, you know. I'm sure he'd be he'd be happy to. I can't speak for him, but he yeah. seems like a great guy and likes to share. And from my yeah. conversations with Wit and my meetings, so I can definitely introduce you. Awesome. You That'd know, another way for mentors, like I, I'm, I'm almost shy to say this because I don't want the calls. But on Facebook, I've often been private message where people have called me. I, I'm, I'm a slow typer, so when somebody calls me for help, I just say, "Here's my number. Call me." Right? I just I like to do these discussions on my commute between home and clinic. Yeah. And so I've helped people um, that I don't know personally just on Facebook where they've asked me some questions, both from the practice management side um, and from just treating fertility. And what's really neat is this is where I, I, I love some of the people I've met is out of nowhere, I'll get a nice gift basket in the mail with a thank you card. And again, because I don't see a lot of that. So I think that's um, quite impressive, the people that have reached out to me in the last couple of years, the thoughtfulness. And and I'm human beings. It just makes me want to help that person more the next time, right? Versus they're just calling you to take. That gets tiring. And most of the people you're going to find that are worth their weight in gold are busy people. Most people don't have time. And so you got to kind of catch them when you can 
Um, because to say, can we schedule time is challenging because we're busy. My schedule's packed full. So when I talk to people, oftentimes like that, it's got to be on a drive between um, my work and my home. To schedule a special talk for somebody that I don't know on Facebook, I'm just not set up for it, right? Yeah, and when yeah. it comes to fertility, I just refer them to, I'm a fellow of the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine, and they have a great Google group, if you're a member, a private group, and they have a mentorship. So I, when they ask for fertility questions now, I send them to Randine Lewis's page, the Clinical Excellence Fertility Program that you have to join to become a member, or the ABORM, because there's infrastructure set up for that. That's awesome. Um, but that's another thing is, you know, it's not right. Don't call up somebody and say, um, can, I, can, I, can I pick your brain for a minute? Um, you're asking for that, but, you know, people have to eat. So be transparent. I would love to get some advice from you. Can I take you out for lunch, you know, and, 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 or take you for a tea and ask some questions? That's the best way to do it versus, hey, I know you're busy. Um, can I talk to you for five minutes and just get some ideas? Um, that probably won't impress the person you want to support you. So, yeah. um, so, and the same thing when you're looking for referrals with other healthcare providers, you got to show value to them and be considerate of their time and appreciative of their time. So, when I received that those gift baskets, and I've received several, um, I'm blown away each time. And those people, I've continued to help when they want because it's just that kind gesture out of nowhere, not expecting it. And one of them, you know, you know, I'm in Vancouver and people I get are from around the states and around the world. Sometimes they send something that's very specific to their area, like a special store that you can't get anywhere else. It's and awesome. it's just so the thoughtfulness, right? It's just yeah. that extra mile. They care. Extra mile. See? She, this person showed that they cared about the time I gave them. And, and I was touched by it. And it made me want to – I was like, this, this is great. If you're giving of yourself and you don't feel it's being valued or appreciative, it's not as motivating. That's all. That's a mo that's awesome, Lauren. You know that those tips are really great tips, and I'm sure you know the listener that's listening to this interview is probably like, "Wow, these are really things I haven't thought of." You know, and and understanding that maybe that's why I'm not succeeding. You know, and and that brings us to the topic of this conversation that we're going to be going over is okay. why acupuncturists fail. You know, and really, you know, that's why I came to you. You know, you said you have, you know, getting ready to release your book, um, and you know, we could talk about that and everything, but you know, the major topic is of why do acupuncturists fail? And why don't we go over that? Sure. Well, the title of my book is called Missing the Point, Why Acupuncturists Fail and What They Need to Know to Succeed. And I'm just going to give you a brief history of why I wrote this book. Because, you know, there's an expression, those that cannot do teach. You've heard of that, right? Yes. So for the longest time, colleagues have said, you should write a book about this. But I'm busy. I'm running Prodi seminars, AccuBalance Wellness Center, Integrated Fertility Symposium, and I like to play. I got a family and friends, and we do things, right? So I had no real desire to write the book, but I was asked and asked, and finally I said, this is a great, I'm going to just get my thoughts on paper and share with, with my colleagues. So I wrote the book, and I did a, a couple of lectures. The last one I did was in San Francisco a couple of years ago, and after the question was, hey, would you create a mentorship program? Would you continue to do this from your book? You know, I didn't have the book out at this time. It um, wasn't written at this time. Would you continue to do this? And I said, no, because those that can't do teach. And I can do, so there's no desire yeah, <laughs> to like keep I, doing this. Yeah. But I'm happy to share with you what I think and what has made my practice successful. And I have mentored other people, and their practices are successful, and my associates have successful practitioners. So um, what I'm going to share, um, I think, is, is what I always say, it's simple but not easy. But let's just get right to the point. Yeah, Why exactly. do acupuncturists fail? Okay, It's really simple. Acupuncturists fail because you are a small business. And small businesses fail. So you know what? It really isn't because you're an acupuncturist that you're failing. It's because you're a small business. Small families that start restaurants fail, naturopaths fail, anybody who starts a business fails. Two reasons, or a couple of reasons here. First of all, it's hard to be great at everything. So you're an acupuncturist, so you went in this to help people. You want to help people heal. And there's a skill to being an acupuncturist. That takes up a lot of mind share and time. So how do you become great at marketing? How do you become great at customer service? 
How do you keep your accounting, your books? How do you do your tax forms? There's so much that is involved to operate a practice. So the first myth we have to dispel is you are actually in business. When you open up a practice, you are in business. You're in the business of selling health. People are going to pay you for that advice and for the treatment of acupuncture. So acupuncture fail because they deny that they're in, they're in business. And this is one of the reasons why they fail. Because all small businesses have a very high failure rate. As I mentioned, you don't have the resources, so skills to run a business. Or you don't have the resource called money to run a business. Because it takes time to build a successful business. So you often will run out of money or you don't have the money to dedicate yourself to your practice. So you need to find other work or you need to quit your job as an acupuncturist to find another job to pay your bills. So this right now, we could stop the podcast. If you just change your mindset and realize you're in business and start to treat your practice as a business, you can lead to success. Now, there's a few things I want to share that are really important to me. It's not about the money. So this podcast and my book is not about making you rich, no. although it will help you become financially abundant. The key is to help people. And my goal for you and for myself is I want to get paid well helping people. I want to get paid well doing something I love. Remember, I was a chartered accountant making a really nice living and I changed careers and it was risky because could I make a living at it? So if I wanted just the money part, I would have stayed as a chartered accountant. But my heart was in Chinese medicine through my own experience of it healing my life and changing my life. So everything we're going to share in this podcast and my book, the goal is to keep you in practice so you can help people and help people get well and heal your community. So a few things I want to share about some of the issues that we have as acupuncturists as small business. One of them is our attitude. Your attitude is key in being successful. If you have a negative attitude towards money, it's going to be very hard to be successful because you're putting out the intention or energy to repel something that you think you want, money. And you can tell if you have an issue with money um, if you're resentful with people that have money, if you don't like people with fancy cars or big diamonds on their fingers, if that, if that makes you uncomfortable or you, don't, you can't accept money from your patients when they pay you for something, then you may have an underlying subconscious negative relationship with money. So the first thing is changing your attitude towards money. Um, second thing um, that's really important just on the whole idea of why acupuncture's fell and they're related to, related to the fact that they're in business is that when you look at, um, it's, it's what I call a myth, basically. Patients can't tell the difference between a good acupuncture and herbal prescription from a poor one. So if you think it's about your skill set that's going to make you busy or not, that, in my opinion, is a myth. Because there are some amazing practitioners, scholar amazing practitioners that are very slow, that see hardly any patients. And then there's some very average practitioners that have incredibly busy practices. So I would challenge the idea that your skill set is what makes you busy. And there's so many other factors that are going to make you a busy, successful on the practice side. And what I wish is, wouldn't it be great to have both? That you have a busy practice, so you're a skilled business side of the practice, and you're a skilled practitioner so you have a busy practice, you have abundance, you make a lot of money so you can choose to give back to the communities that you want to give back to, and you're really helping people. So that's what my goal of doing this podcast with you and my book is I want you to be a great practitioner that can heal people, but I also want you to be able to be a good practitioner on the business side. It's a yin-yang thing. If you just focus on one, you're not going to be successful. If you're an excellent practitioner, but you don't know how to run your business, you may not see very many patients, so you know what? You're not helping that many people anyhow. So my goal is to help you help as many people as possible and be successful. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, truthfully, I mean, I'm 29. I've been in business for th going on to three years now, and I feel that, you know, like you said, you know, that average acupuncturist, I mean, I wouldn't hold myself up, you know, to being this huge, very scholared acupuncturist, and I work very hard studying all the time, reaching out to mentors, trying to find answers, becoming better at what I do, but I am a very busy acupuncturist and I feel that 
and you know what, I do help a lot of people, but what I do is, and I think what you strictly did was you really found a niche yeah. and you know, that niche thing is, and you got so good at that one thing and you've reached out to all these humongous people and humongous people within that niche that were so good at what they did. And you learned and learned and learned and learned and learned to the point where you then became that expert within that niche. So and that's another thing that I feel is so important. I'm sure that is another uh, is a golden nugget from your book, it which is? I haven't even yeah. talked or even looked at a piece of that book yet, which I can't wait to get my hands on it. Um, is that you know finding that niche and getting so good in that niche that you are the expert and there's in that field because and I'm I'm sure that's one of the things you really want to go over mm -hmm. because. And I'm, I'm strictly 99% of the stuff I cover in within my practice is sports medicine is, is mm -hmm. pain management, musculoskeletal. And, you know, and that's really what I work on. It's just, and I, and I try to find answers. I, I study, you know, I'll take a whole two, three, four, five days and go study with Matt Callison or go study right. with wit or go study with Chad or, you know, get books. I have a bookshelf of 50 sports medicine acupuncture books right over there that I flip through every day that, oh, hip pain, all right, what, and pull out each book and see, all right, this is hip, this is hip, this is hip, where am I looking at, what am I doing, all right, how can I relate this to this case, this to this case, and this to this case, and build my case for this person, and I, and I go that extra mile for that patient so that I can literally get that person better, because if the faster that person gets, at, even though, you know, you want to have those people that are recurring, they just want to come to you and love you, but... The more people you make better, the more referrals you're just going to keep coming back. Yeah, referrals are the key. And you'll find in practice that some of the people that you don't get better, but they show that you cared and there was that connection and they, they'll refer you. You'll have some people that were told they need surgery, they've had issues for 10 years and you'll do two treatments and it's gone and they'll never refer you. <laughs> and then you'll have somebody that you worked on six times and you didn't improve, but they're going to refer you time. That's my whole point about it's not so much... Um, the point prescription, the herbal, there's this other thing yes. that gets the referrals. However, what you're talking about is this niche thing is very important. I call it, it's my chapter 11, Big Fish in a Small Pond is the name of that oh, chapter. Awesome. And what the underlying current is, is called confidence. Patients can smell confidence. So when you create a niche on your side, you become very confident in this area because that's all you're focusing on. You're learning that you know it, you can talk it, and Patients can sense the confidence. If you go in and the patient sees you and they don't get the sense that you feel you can help them, they're not going to be eager to see you. Going back to the, the niche or being an expert, like for me, it's fertility. For you, it's sport medicine. What it does is, first of all, it's not counter, counter to Chinese medicine. The first challenge I, have been, I was told when I did specialize is, this is not Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine does not specialize. Um, it's holistic medicine. So let me put that myth to bed as well in yeah. that I treat fertility. However, that's what's out to the patient and that's my, my focus. So that's what they see and it attracts patients because patients want to see an expert. They really do. However, I still treat holistically. So when my patients come in, I do a full intake. Exactly. There's Tan, there's Paul's palpation. Um, I check their digestion, so if they have constipation or loose stools, their oh. body temperature, their headaches. So just you can specialize like you do, but you still treat holistically. But this is your communication to the patients. And it's if you specialize, you'll get better at treating that a lot quicker than if you're just a generalist because there are certain patterns you're going to see when you treat pain or you treat infertility. There's certain things that I can tell you that um, within just looking at the forms, I can pretty much get their pattern. And I know certain formulas or herbs that are better combinations, whether they've been diagnosed with endometriosis or diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, but both of their patterns are blood stasis, right? So they have the pattern blood stasis. One has the Western diagnosis PCOS. One has the Western diagnosis endometriosis. And my formula may change because of my experience and being in this niche. So you can get better at treating a demographic if that's your niche. The patients, let's just make it obvious for our listeners, you know, if you had a phobia and you go to, um, now it's Google, but in my day it was Yellow Pages, <laughs> but now it's, nobody knows what Yellow Pages are probably, your young listeners, so when you go to search for somebody on the web, 
um, and you have a phobia, and you have a phobia, say, of, um, of heights, who would you choose? The, the website that says we treat phobias of snakes, ladders, heights, bees, um, waters, you know, or would you choose the person that says, I specialize in treating, treating phobia of heights only? Yeah, exactly. Like, so that person is the best at it. They're, they're, they're a hundred percent. You're making that clear. Exactly. So the websites that say I'm an acupuncturist and you say I specialize in infertility, but you list 20 conditions, your, your patients, you know, you're, you're not, you're not communicating clearly. You're not saying what you really want to be saying because you're saying, I want to treat holistically. Um, and you're listing everything you treat, but you're trying to get a certain demographic and that you love to treat. So you have to be brave. So when I was treating, I started off in sport medicine and digestion. That was my thing because of my gut was my health issue. I wanted to treat the gut, IBS and Crohn's colitis, and acupuncture was pain. So I got really good. I did the Matt Callison program. I awesome. studied with um, Dr. Tan. So I went and learned sport medicine well. And when I treated the gut, I treat holistically. So guess what? A lot of women with IBS, not surprising. There's a chi stagnation, liver spleen disharmony type pattern, sometimes blood stasis. You do a full intake. Guess what? They had PMS and dysmenorrhea and painful periods. So while I'm treating them holistically, they came for IBS, their PMS went away, right? And then they started referring friends for their PMS and dysmenorrhea. And that's how I ended up being in women's health is because so many of them came. And then I decided to focus on more women's health. And then I got that fertility patient, and by 2004, I had so many fertility patients, I had a wait list, I made a conscious decision to put out there and only take on fertility-related patients. And then my practice exploded. When I decided to do fertility, my colleagues thought I was crazy, because back when I decided to do fertility, people weren't doing fertility. Remember, in your textbooks, it's a miscellaneous disease. It doesn't even have its own category like heavy bleeding. It's under miscellaneous is where infertility is found. Yeah. So nobody thought back in 2001, 2002 to focus on fertility, except for like a Mike Berkeley and Randy Lewis who were already doing it. Nobody else was really doing it in North America. So when I decided to do this, it was considered practice suicide, right? Because from everybody else's experience, they may see one or two fertility patients in a year if they were lucky. Yeah. I was I loved treating fertility. I, I was so passionate about it. So I, I went into it, not for business, I went into it because I loved it. I really wanted to treat this. And what ended up happening is they came out of the woodwork and my practice exploded. So if somebody treats pain, pain's too general too. You can treat all the body parts, but if you really wanted to get busy, find an area like back pain or knee pain and say, and that's what you market. That's what you put out to the to the world, and you'll get so much on that area, just knee pain, that you'll be super busy. But of course, they may have other aches and pains, and once they're in, you can educate them. So when they come into my clinic for fertility, people think they have to be trying to get pregnant to come to my practice. But when you treat infertility, you're treating gynecology, you're regulating the cycle, you're treating the person. It's Chinese medicine, right? You're treating the person. But inside, I educate them about endometriosis, irregular periods, PMS, menopause, and they refer their friends who aren't trying to get exactly. But, but my website is mostly on fertility. So a niche is like pain. You got to go for like like if you just like somebody said, what should if I wanted to treat something and I wanted to be busy, what should it be? Pediatrics is a great area to get into if you want to grow a practice fast. And what a rewarding practice. Because these people grow up learning about Chinese medicine, so as adults, they'll choose to come too, probably. Um, dermatology. Dermatology is, is a big, um, is an area. Because you know what? It's uncomfortable. It's itchy. It doesn't look nice, especially if it's on your arms or your face. People are motivated to get their skin cleared up. People are motivated to help their kids. Um, the other thing is fertility and pregnancy. That's a no-brainer too. People will do anything for the kids. So it's a great area where you'll have a motivated group to help. And it's so rewarding when people come in with their babies and when you treat pregnant women, they're glowing and they're happy. It's a great reward. Pain is a motivator, right? People don't like to be in pain. Pain is, so, of course, yeah. So these are areas that you could do. I mean, if I, for me, I think insomnia and headaches. If somebody could just master treating insomnia or headaches, um, you would be, you would have a wait list. It's oh, just, yeah. It's a trainer. But if your website says, I treat insomnia, I treat headaches, and you list 20 things, 
you're a master of nothing to the yeah. public. Yeah. And they don't get the holistic, or some do, but most don't get that you're going to treat them holistic anyhow. And we know that if somebody has headaches, you can't just focus on the headache. You need to treat the whole person. But that's how you treat. But outside, you communicate the headache, and you become very good, and you start to know all the conventional, and you know about cranial sacral, you learn about uh, homeopathy, you learn about the other modalities, so you become a good referral as well to share. So same with fertility. We work with reproductive endocrinologists. We work with clinical hypnotherapists that do fertility. We work with um, mind abdominal massage people. I have a naturopath in my practice that does functional medicine. I'm trained in functional medicine, so I use it as well. And now you become an incredible integrated resource where I can do awesome Chinese medicine through diet, acupuncture, herbal, lifestyle. And I have resources that I can reach out to and refer to to really give this individual an incredible holistic integrative care, which patients love. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that's it's it's what it's all about is being that go to person for what you want to be. You know, and I, I love it that you know it's it's crazy that it found you more or less your your niche. It's not like you you were like this is what I want to do. This is my 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 uh, you know dream. And it found, it, it found it you. But you find a niche that you love. Like if you just choose, oh, dermatology is going to make me busy. Remember, my intention is I want you to help people and become successful at the same time. I want that um, yin yang aspect of it. Yeah. Um, if you do it just for the money, I think it won't work. You I know, again, hundred percent. Because the love for it, like the fertility, I love the hormone and the balance. I love gynecology. I love the conventional allopathic understanding of the hormonal system. Love it. The whole. Uh, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, and ovarian axis. Love it. Right? That's how I'm with muscles and skeleton. Yeah. It's it's like I I literally can talk to somebody about you know the you know muscle bellies all day long and the, the attachments and this and that and all day long. It's it's so, funny. So that's so. What should I focus in? Something that you love to do because when you love to do it and you're passionate about it, like AJ saying, then it's not work. You just will do it. On my honeymoon. My wife accused me of being a workaholic because I had this book open on fertility. From a West, I had a Western and Chinese medicine books I brought on our honeymoon to the Dominican Republic. And she looked at me. She goes, why are you working? And I looked at her in, in amazement. This is I go, it work? I, that's what I, I said. What, I first, I was confused. Why, I'm not work, why do you say I'm working? Why, what am I being guilty of? And she goes, look what you're reading. And I looked at it, and it was on Chinese medicine and gynecology. And I was like, huh. I just love this stuff. I read this. I I read this stuff all day long. Instead this of the newspaper, like yeah, it's, yeah exactly. Like yeah. it's. So I was having a blast. Yeah. I was sitting there relaxing. I wasn't taking notes. I was just. I enjoy reading it. So, if you find something you love, then you'll probably do well with it. Okay, that's my opinion. You got to be passionate about it. Pain is too broad. I think you can treat pain, but maybe list three conditions on your website or on your brochure. Three things that you want to get good at or you are good at. Like I said, knee pain, back pain, or shoulder pain, something, um, and then you'll attract that. If you start to list too many, then you look like you're just a generalist again, and that doesn't, and it's not as attractive to patients. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, I p strictly put out there about plantar fasciitis, shoulder pain, knee pain, and back pain. Those are the things I, sh you, you know, I really focus on, and and obviously that's how I get my referrals back. That you know that I help this person for that, and it's strictly kind of gone. You know, a snowball effect in that in that realm. You know, when I did sport medicine, I love to treat IT band friction syndrome, right, from the bikers. I learned that both from yeah. Matt Whit and Whit how to um, treat that. And I used to tell people I love this because a lot of triathletes in Vancouver, and um, I had a busy practice. Just and it was, and I I did it enough that if it was unilateral, I knew I needed one treatment to fix it. It was unilateral, but I always tell them two to three in case, right, just yeah. to get also to make sure. If it was bilateral, then I knew, because again, I did enough of it, that it was usually a lower a lower vertebrae issue, right? It's usually something in the lower back. If it's bilateral, not so much one-sided, and that would take longer. But that's the niche thing, the experience. So yeah. if somebody came in with one-sided IT band friction syndrome, I was like, great. And I had my little thing with my needle technique with EA and my cupping on the IT band. I had my little thing that I knew would work for that syndrome, I, and I loved it. And I told my patients about it, and they would, because you know they complained, and they would tell their buddies, "Hey, Lauren can treat this," you know. And so I, they'd come in, and I'd ask, "What else hurts you? What anything else? How's your gut?" Your, I look at everything, and then they, a lot of them wouldn't just come in for the the leg pain; they'd come in for other health things. So again, 
you put out there your niche and that will help you attract people and then you still treat holistically. So any other golden nuggets from this book that you know that you want to share that how about like um, money wise um, you know I know you're you're very strictly very busy practice and I know a lot of people have issues with you know I, I think this is a big reason why acupuncturists fail is that you know, understanding taking cash or, or, or insurance, being in network, out of network, all these, these are things that, you know, that acupuncturist that is getting into business, you know, is a huge thing to know. Yeah. You know, for me, we're a cash practice. I'm not a fan of the insurance practices. And, and in Canada, just to let you know, it's a social system. So if you go see your doctor, it's free. Okay. Um, and that's just how it is to see your doctor. Um, so, just to let you know, acupuncturists aren't part of the insurance plan out here. Okay. Um, some people may have private, but we have busy practices. So if you start to argue you need insurance, all that, I can just say, well, my competition is free and we're busy, right? <laughs> so, so free has no value. But just to get to the insurance, I, I couldn't tell you. I, what I don't like about the insurance side is the insurance company starts to tell you what you can treat, how you can treat, and, um, and it can become a racket on its own. But it's hard, my understanding, talking to some American colleagues, it can be challenging to, to collect. And I know some practices that actually have to hire somebody, pay somebody full time just to keep chasing yes. the insurance money. 100%. My business has that. Yeah. So personally, I like the, the cash basis. Um, cash as in you can pay by check, cash or visa. We don't collect it from the insurance. People have extended medical here through their work. They still pay us. We give them the receipt and then they go to their work it's or their... Bit. They get reimbursed. Yeah. And it just depends on your style. It's my style. Like we do lots of patient centered care. We do we bring a lot of value into the room. And I want to be able to spend time and I don't want somebody dictating to me. Everybody's different. Some people can run a community based multiple bed room where insurance would work great. So you have to be you have to come out in your practice. So if what I do and how I work resonate, then what I'm sharing will, res will work for you. But some people are, are different styles and um, insurance, insurance may work for their style. Mine is more of a higher end type of practice, like the clientele and what we charge and what we give. Um, so um, I don't like the insurance for that. I know when the chiropractors in British Columbia, they don't do acupuncture, but just the chiropractic service, they were once part of the insurance system where they got covered by the medical system here in British Columbia. And they were thrown out. They threw out a whole bunch of people because it's costly. And um, a lot of people freaked out because, you know, they thought patients won't come. But the ones that were good practitioners and, and could run a good business, they love it now. They're busier and they make more than they did when they were under insurance. And so, again, um, they had fears. But when they got out of it and they made it work, it was great. If you're, again, if you know how to run a business is a big part of it. Yeah, I think that is the biggest thing. And, you know, my business, I, you know, this is off top, you know, in my area, a lot of people do have coverage for acupuncture. And I guess in where I am, it's very tough to say, oh, I'm not going to take your, strictly when someone would say, all right, well, I'm just going to go find someone that will take my insurance. You know, that's that fear of people having. And I guess that's where maybe fear I have of. You got to be clear on what you want then. And so, yeah. like. You can't treat everybody, and there's enough people to go around. So, um, in my book, I mention this, and it's it's in general, you got to know it, intention is so important. So you got to know what you want. So I know what my ideal client is, and so once you're clear on what your ideal client is, it's easy to say no to these other people. If you're not clear on that, then you're going to want to say yes to everybody. And you know, there's that eighty twenty rule. Twenty percent of the people will take up eighty percent of your time. Also, twenty percent of the people will generate eighty percent of your revenue. So I do this at AccuBalance, for staff, for Pro-D. I try not to work with people that are going to take up 80% of my time. So, you know, when I look for speakers, if a speaker's high maintenance, difficult to work with, I just, even if they're a great name, I'll choose to let them go, wish them well, hopefully they'll go to them under my computer, competitors, let them take up their time, and that opens up room for more people and my happiness quotient. Same thing for patients. You know, rather than trying to have to have everybody be my patient, I like the ideal patient that works for me, and if they don't work for me, I'm happy that they go somewhere else because I want to be able to give my attention to all my patients and to my team, my six associates, right? And so if I have somebody that's sucking my life energy and my time, that's not going to work. So it depends on the person. For me, I'm an entrepreneur that focuses in health and wellness, and I despise bureaucracy. Bureaucracy, in my opinion, is the downfall of North America. 
It kills small business, and it's why Canada and the United States, I don't know where our economies will be in the, in the coming decade because there's so much bureaucracy and red tape, and 100%. insurance is part of that. So for me, I just don't like bureaucracy, and that's what insurance is. So it doesn't jive with my personality. Yeah. I, I hate inefficiency and, and stuff like that. and filling out, I, it, it just it would take the fun out of it. So that's not for me. But some people are great at filling out forms and love that stuff. And so, and those are the people you'd have to hire for your practice, or I would yeah. if I had to take insurance. Yeah. Because it would suck my energy. It wouldn't be fun. No, oh, so, 100%. So, um, but going to attitude and just intention, um, intention is so important. And, and this is kind of part of the pro D side for me, is why I created pro D seminars. And it's just, it's a continuing education platform. And it came about because I love to learn. And one of the things for anybody, if you want to be successful, is you need to invest in yourself. It's part of that confidence. You need to protect your confidence and keep your confidence high and growing all the time. And if you're constantly investing in yourself, not just in Chinese medicine courses, but I do spiritual practices, life coaching practices. I take business coaching practices, um, things that are just going to make you more conscious overall in life and increase your health and happy quotient is important, plus your skill of being a practitioner and the skill of running a practice, you got to invest in yourself. So I constantly invest in myself. And ProD's tagline is called Knowledge, Confidence, Success. Because what I learned on, and I, I want to hear if you've had this experience as well, and to the listeners, think of this yourself, is what I started realizing is when I would take a workshop that inspired me, I was excited. I couldn't wait to treat on Monday, right? I felt, wow, I got so excited that this was going to work and I'm so excited to hear some great um, acupuncture and herbal uh, approaches and diagnosis. And lo and behold, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I would start to get phone calls for the very thing I just studied. Has that ever happened to you? It's 100%. It's so funny. Even the last I studied with Matt Callison, um, and he, he gave like a two-week or two day course on like the neck and shoulder, um, which I strictly am very, very focused with those things. And I was sitting in course and I was like, wait a sec, like all these things are, I'm working on them right now. Like these exact things, like, like a, a, a thoracic outlet syndrome, like huge issue with that. Like, a, a, and I have like three patients and literally I went back within like one to two treatments. Every one of them was like better, which was unbelievable. It was like uh, amazing. So that happens. Like when you take a course, patients you're seeing will pop in your head and then you can call them saying, hey, because I would do this. I would work with somebody that we didn't get the results we wanted and I'd email them. Now I'd email them. Back then I would call them and I would say, I just came out of a workshop and I think I have a, a better approach to work with your frozen shoulder. I'd like to see you again because I, they popped in my head, right? The other factor is people just call out of the woodwork, whether they're old patients or new patients for that condition. And what I believe is happening, and I share, is that intention. Intention. And so knowledge, basically what happens is you learn something. The knowledge creates um, some confidence, the knowledge. And what it does is it, it, it amplifies your intention. So it's called knowledge, confidence, success, because the knowledge, the new learning you get, starts to increase your confidence. The confidence that um, helps you put out intention into the ether, you're putting something out there. And the more you believe that you can help, the more confident you are, the stronger that intention is. And then that intention goes out and people sense it and then they get attracted to coming to your clinic. Is what, that's the only way I can explain it because yeah. I've observed this over and over again and there's the success part. So I love it. whenever I was slow as a young practitioner, I would go and take a course. No joke. I would take a course or read some material. Now, I have six associates, and so when a younger, newer associate comes, part of the thing is they have to keep doing learning. But if somebody has a slow schedule, I will meet with them to see what's going on. Oftentimes, there's something going on personally. You know, when your energy scattered, it's funny how your, your practice schedule can fall apart. And then I would just help them get re-inspired and give them either articles to read, case studies we have at our clinic, or have them look at something in Pro-D that I think would help them um, get re-inspired and motivated. And it's amazing, you know, I want you to do this PCOS course. We have so much PCOS on Pro-D. So do these. And next thing you know, they're diagnosing PCOS where women are coming in and they don't even know they have it. And then they send them for the right test, the conventional testing, and they come diagnosed with real, they really have it. The doctor missed it and the patients are coming in. It works. And I, I'm curious if your listeners, if you have this, when you start to study or do a workshop, all of a sudden, do you notice you start to get calls for what you studied? 
I believe what's happening is if the speaker inspires you, if the speaker makes you feel like you don't know anything and they make you insecure, it doesn't work. It has to inspire you. You got to feel excited and confident. And that knowledge, again, increases your confidence. That confidence impacts the, the signal that you send out, your intention to the ether. And the stronger the confidence is, the stronger the signal and the easier it is to attract people. And that is one of the things I share in my book is the how do you attract patients. And it's you got to keep investing in yourself. Constantly invest. And that investing is helping with your confidence. Entrepreneurs know at all costs you must protect your confidence. You're a small business person. So you're an entrepreneur. You're a small business person. You must protect your confidence. And as acupuncturists, we have a chip on our shoulder. We're quite insecure. We have other people wanting to use our scope of practice from the way I read things on Facebook. We get concerned. We're told what we do sometimes doesn't work by the studies. So we're always having our confidence challenged. Yes. So it's important to have the mentor and to continue to read and study things that inspire you and show you that this works and why so you can keep protecting your confidence and strengthening your confidence. I and it. I still do this to this day. I'm 15 years into practice, 16 years into practice as of our recording here, January 2016. And um, I still constantly learn. And Pro D is great because I'm always moderating. Yeah, so exactly. Always, You're learning but, constantly. That's like right now I'm learning from you, Lauren. Like it's, it's you know, the exact same reason for this. And, you know, going back to what you were just saying about, you know, attracting patients and, you know, a lot of people want the patient first, you know, and that's the big thing. Uh, what's coming across from you is that, you know, no, the patient doesn't come first. You develop first and then the patient comes. You know, you, we have to get attractive to attract people. And that's yes. one of the biggest things I've gotten from a lot of mentors is you have to become an attractive person. You know, a lot of people are all, we're not talking about looks here. We're talking about knowledge, attraction of knowledge and, and, and building that knowledge base and building the confidence through it, through putting time in and, and investing in yourself and sacrificing, you know, not, you know, doing these things throughout life of maybe you might have to go, go back to school. Maybe you have to take courses. You have to read books. You have to sit down with people and go meet with people instead of, you know, going on vacation or going to the parties, going to these places that, you know, Oh, well, you know, I need to do these. No, you need to invest in yourself, get yes. attractive, and then you'll attract the patient. AJ, you, Perfect. I love this. And I want to rephrase this because this Go is for so yeah, important yeah. for our, our exactly. listeners. Think of who your ideal client is, your ideal patient, and then ask yourself, what kind of practitioner do I need to become to attract that patient? No, I love it. Exactly. Because, you know, we're a high-end practice. And if somebody's going to pay good fees to see me, who do I have to be? What kind of knowledge and skill set do I have to have? What kind of way of communication and availability do I have to have? And so that's part of the experience at AccuBalance. You know, we have biomats on every table. Those aren't cheap, right? They give off infrared heat and negative ions. You know, we have the electric tables. And then our practitioners, you can't work at AccuBalance unless you're willing to do so many hours a month in continued education. So you know your, your licensing body has your minimum hours. So in British Columbia, it's 25 hours a year. California, 25 hours a year. Um, NCCOM, 15 hours a year, right? My people, we do maybe, you probably have to do a good five hours a month minimum in continued education. So people at AccuBalance are doing over 60 hours of continued education a year. So that's why people get on planes, I think, to come to our practice. We have created you know we become that patient we become attractive to the patient that's and awesome. and that's what you have to do and you know you talked about the vacation thing when i graduated from my chinese medicine school a whole bunch of my classmates used their loans and went on a holiday and i opened up my clinic the next day and i used that money to help start up my practice oh exactly you know? exactly and look where you are and it shows <laughs> yeah. and, and and it's all about and that's why you're coming out with books and that's why you're on the other side of this right now when we're picking your brain because you've done it. You've been there and that's where we want to learn as younger practitioners to learn from people like you that can give us the knowledge and obviously that's why you came out with this book and, and, and can show us the right ways and learn so we don't fail as acupuncturists. And that's the thing is, you know, we are you know, I think the typical acupuncturist fails in this country and probably in Canada, America, and across the world um, yeah. because of the knowledge base. They don't have the sources to, to, to succeed. 
Yeah, they it's again they're in business and the reality check. I saw a Facebook post on new grads saying how much should we get paid, and they're saying 160 to 180, and they're comparing themselves to physicians and all that. And it's just um, I don't know where their heads are at actually when they're coming out, but the expectations they come out of, out of school may not be. Um, realistic. Yeah, um, I call it entitlement syndrome. It's a oh, disease. It's bad. That it's I, I. It's really bad, and I've noticed that too. And you know, a lot, a lot of people necessarily that I've graduated with, or, or people that are graduating recently and stuff, I see it a lot that people are f- going from job to job to job, and the issue is, is like they're they they can't they're not willing to put the time in and the effort in to build. And a lot of the time and effort, and you got to create values. So you don't deserve anything. So we don't come out of school deserving to be paid anything. Just to let you know, it doesn't matter how much schooling you've done. Um, If you create value for somebody, then they're going to pay you for that value. So you have to be able to create value for people. Nobody cares how many years you went to school, right? Um, They just want to know that you can treat what they have efficiently and effectively. That's what matters. I've never had. I've never. Had anybody asked me how many years I went to school or where I placed in my Chinese medicine school, I've never asked my doctor um, for his transcripts from university or med school. Okay, um, so exactly. but I but what I do want to know is, do they have a reputation of treating good bedside manners, and do they have a reputation of good success? Um, what's the word on the street? And that's the what your patients are going to do is, um, do you create value? Um, remembering patients can't tell the difference between a good acupuncture prescription and a poor one. Same with herbal. The herbal medicine to them all tastes the same, bitter, right? The acupuncture points, they don't know. And you know, when somebody says, you know, you know, you ch- let's say you charge a hundred bucks for your for your points, right? You know, they they they'll say, why so much, right? You know, well, it's it's knowing it's not placing the needle that they're paying you for. It's to know where to place the needle, right? Yeah. And what combination. So, but. So going back to just the this whole the intention and the and the attitude, one thing is you'll see people that are successful, and I want to let you know that I don't know anybody that's an overnight success, myself included. One of the key things that I another business pro I'd like to give you is persistence is key. Um, I mention often when I lecture and in my book that anybody can start. It's like a marathon. Anybody can start a marathon, but not everybody gets across the finish line. So the key is persistence. And the analogy I like to use is like the old-fashioned whales where you um, – well water, where you pump the, uh, the uh, arm to get the, uh, the water out. You have to pump that maybe 99 times. And on the 100th pump, you get water. So many people see the person when they're doing the 100th pump and they see the successful practitioner. And they're like, oh, my God, I'm going to do what they – I'm going to be like them. And you try and um, mimic them or tomorrow. be like them. They would try to be that tomorrow, and they want to be making the same amount of money as them tomorrow. You have to do the 99 pumps. What you don't realize is myself and all these other successful practitioners have pumped the well 99 times. Now, once you get the water, every pump gives you water. But when I did number one, nothing. Number two, nothing. Number three, nothing. Four, you're going to read my book, and you're going to be pumping. And you're like, this doesn't work, Lauren. You're on number six, number seven. <laughs> <laughs> persistence is the key. Yeah. You can't stop. And I persist, and then the water comes. And you know what? Once the water comes, every time you do a pump, water comes out. You get return for your for your for your effort. But at the beginning, you may not see it. And it's easy to get discouraged. So the advice I have is, you're in business. So if you're denying your business, God help you. I don't think you can be successful because part of it is the attitude is you are running a business. Yeah. Okay. You are. It's just it's a fact. And businesses fail. Small businesses fail. You're a small business, so you're at a very high risk of failing. One of the key indicators or key differentiators are do you realize you're in business and you're running your practice as a business? Remember the key underlying tone here is you are doing this to help people, but you can't help people if you can't pay your own bills or you can't keep your lights on or your phone on and you have to close your shop. So it's important that you get paid well to help people. It's important that you are helping people still, but you are in business. The other most important point I can share here is persistence. Everybody start can start like a marathon, but only a few will finish, get to that finish line. So it takes persistence and it takes years to build that up. Okay, And you're going to have roadblocks. And if you're passionate about the medicine and helping people like AJ is and myself and so many of my colleagues that are successful, then when you get the roadblocks, you keep going forward. Right. Yeah, when I started this medicine, my, it wasn't even regulated in British Columbia. It is now. So when I started, it wasn't regulated. I graduated from a program 
okay? Um, and then they regulated it. And they chose a period of time to grandparent. And they, they chose up to a year before my time. So although I was already practicing, they didn't grandparent test, which was odd. They, I don't know how they arbitrarily chose it. So I had to go write an acupuncture exam. I'm already in practice, busy, trying to be busy. Now I have to go back and hit the books and practice, write a board exam. And then guess what happened? Two years later, they said, we're regulating herbs. So I had to go back and hit the books. I mean, it, it's easier to quit. Like how frustrating, right? <laughs> and now I'm focusing on fertility. Now I have to learn to treat everything again, right? You know, like some of those formulas I don't use as often. So I had to go back and study. And then a couple years later, they regulate us as doctors. So I had to go do another board exam, right? Wow. Those were challenges, right? And I had associates. I mean, so I can tell you, it's not easy. And then in our industry, you know, when I started with fertility, I'm on site now at the IVF clinic, okay? But when I started and I did rounds for them, they threw me out basically. And they used to tell their patients not to go to AccuBounce. Now we're on site and we do talks together. So I got thrown out. And AccuBounce pioneered acupuncture for IVF in all the clinics in British Columbia. I was the first person to be on site at every clinic. But it was never a warm welcome in the, in the first couple of years. It was a lot of work and it was persistence. And they definitely threw me out. But I didn't go away. And now I'm on site in one of the largest clinics in Van I'm in on site in the largest clinic in Vancouver. That's amazing. We have, and we do talks together. Persistence, persistence. I was so passionate about this. I believe in the medicine. I want to help the people. No was not an option. And I kept on going. So I didn't take it personal, right? In no. business, don't take things personal. So I just kept on persisting and persisting and persisting. So persistence is very important. It's, I get discouraged. You're going to get discouraged. You got to brush off and go back at it the next day. I love it. You know, that was some great stuff. And uh, we look forward to your book coming out. Um, do we have a, a date set for that at all? We do. March 2016. Um, I've been told that it will be ready for print. Um, so it will be available. Um, I'll probably put something up on the ProDeseminars.com website. And, um, and hopefully um, um, I have a lecture uh, around the book. Actually, how I wrote the book. So just to show you neat ideas, right? I'm not a writer. Awesome. I, I, like, I don't like to type. Um, as I told you, when, pay, when people ask for advice and they email me to email, I don't email them back. I'm like, you got to call me on my drive. Yeah, exactly. I'm, not, I'm not typing. So I tried for a long time to write this book, and I was just struggling with it. It was so hard. So what I decided to do is think outside the box. I'm going to create a, a lecture. So I created a lecture. I did a first time I did it was three hours, um, and then I got some feedback. Then I did it again at four hours, and then I did it again at six hours. And then I took that six-hour lecture, and while I got it lectured, I had it recorded, and then I transcribed it, and then I worked with my editor. Exactly. So, so I actually have a lecture that goes with that can go with the book, and so hopefully I'll see you there if I if I take this on the road a couple of places. Awesome. But that's also thinking outside the box. I've tried so hard to write this book, and I just couldn't. I'm not a. It's not my style to write so well, and but I like to lecture, and I just decided to create a lecture, and I fine tuned it, and once I liked the lecture, recorded it. And then I, I got it transcribed, and then we cleaned it up and made it into a book. I love it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I would be the exact, if you know, it comes to that point, I, I definitely have ambitions and goals to write a book someday, um, like yourself, and, you know, be successful and everything. But, you know, I totally see myself being that same way as, as speaking it and it being transcribed or, or, you know, to a ghostwriter type thing because of just my skills of not being, uh, I'm not a writer, I'm a speaker and a listener. Right. You know, I, I listened to everything. That's how, why Acupuncture on Fire came about was that, you know, I listened to everything. I can't, when I open books, stuff really doesn't stick well. But when I listen to books, everything sticks. You know, in 2015, I, I, I listened to over 150 books. I didn't read one book, you know, right. but I listened to them. But I consider myself that I read them. It's still the same thing, just like you spoke your book. Right. You know, it's the same, it's that same concept and I love it. And it's, it, it definitely resonates with me as being very similar in that, in that matter. Yeah. You hire an editor or a ghostwriter, it's your material because a ghostwriter yeah. will, can write your book for you. But when you hire an editor or a ghostwriter, they're just going to take the transcription and clean it up because certain things that go well in a lecture, you have less room in a book. So they have to, they have to shrink it up. So, you know, you get an editor, a proofreader and, um, you know, that was, that's what I had. My editor was really good at my, my grammar because, you know, when I speak, it's probably not the best grammar. So the it. editor really helped with the grammar. Oh, and that's I, great. 
I sent it out to about 15 of my colleagues. Again, because of Pro-D, I have access. So I got 15 of our high-end colleagues, um, uh, high-end as I mean successful practitioners, knowledgeable practitioners, to um, read it, to see. Give you this feedback. Work? Yeah, should this go out? You know, do you, this is what I wrote, and uh, we got good feedback. And two of them were really good at writing, so they, um, they, they went through the grammar and helped me there. So, you know, it was a joint effort for sure. That's awesome. Um, a free resource I want to mention for your listeners because, again, invest in yourself. So Metagogy.com is my sister site to ProD. It's just free lectures. You can't get any continued education credits, but if you want to just keep learning and getting inspirational, the lectures are always under an hour on that website. Awesome. I'll put the link for that in the show notes and uh, for on YouTube and everything like yeah. that. So it will be on there. Yeah, so we have that YouTube. ProD has a YouTube channel. There's Metagogy for free. ProD, there's a fee for that. We pay our speakers, so there's a fee for every course. Um, but you get continued education credits for that, and um, and uh, those are two resources for our profession. Continue to invest in yourself. Check in on your attitude towards money, um, because how can you attract something that you're actually repelling? So if you have a negative relationship with money, again, it's just chi. It's not the money that's evil. It's the person that uses the money that uses it for good or for evil. Um, yes, it can it can corrupt you. So do your spiritual practices, stay conscious, stay grounded. And as I, I, I like to say, I think the world would benefit from more rich acupuncturists. It would be really nice that acupuncturists had the influence and the finances to support causes. You know, for me, better food, you know, growing food, more organic, better growing, um, better support for our mental health as well. I believe and, it too. You know, so I think um, to me, if we're able to support the communities and if we're able to make money, and again, if, you're, if your basket's full, if you're, if you're abundant, you love what you're doing and you have money, then you have the ability to support causes that are close to your heart. And that's what I do. You know, Right now, we've been supporting a couple of associations and a couple of foundations for acupuncture to get it out there. And so you, know, you guys can do the same. If you get the financial resources, you can be a little bit more influential and supportive in your, in your communities, which is what it's about. For me, my values are my family. You got to take care of my family and 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 be there for my family. And then it goes out to my team and my community, and then my community in Vancouver, in Canada, my acupuncture community. And so, um, I think it's it would be great if people um, take an interest in the practice management of acupuncture, so they can keep their doors open and have good chi and feel good and love what they're doing and um, be able to. Uh, support other causes and sleep well at night. Love it. So uh, for the listener, how can they get, if I know that you say that, you know, you'll take calls or whatever and emails and people hit you up on Facebook, but you know, just that if a person did want to find you, um, you know, on the internet, you know, what are your websites? What are all these things, you know, you sure. know lay, lay it out there and I'll put it all in the show notes, but just for the listener. How can all they right. Do? My clinic is acubalance.ca, one C, acubalance.ca. ProDSeminars.com is the website. ProD, it's not prod, it's ProD as in professional development. ProDSeminars.com, all one word. If you email off of ProD or Metagogy, Metagogy is the free site. M-E-D-I-G-O-G-Y.com, Metagogy. It's a play on pedagogy, so it's the study of health and wellness. Awesome. Um, if you email Metagogy or ProD, I get a copy of that email when it goes to the help desk, so it will reach me. Um, ProD and Metagogy have Facebook pages. Um, I have a personal Facebook page, Lauren Brown, Vancouver. You can find me there. People PM me that way. And you can just reach out via email. And um, if, you, if I can help you, I always try. There's only so many hours in a day. Um, but often I return calls during my commute. Awesome. So, uh, you know, keep for the listener, you know, definitely look out for his book coming out in March. And as soon as that is out, it will, I'll connect it with this seminar and, or with this webinar or whatever you want to call it, interview uh, in the show notes and on YouTube and in the, on the podcast and everything like that. So we look forward to hearing it. And I want to thank you so much for coming on and giving so much value to the listener. Yeah, my pleasure. And thanks for thinking of me, AJ, and coming out. I've enjoyed our discussions offline. And I see you to be a good force for the profession. Thanks for putting together this podcast. And uh, thinking of me to uh, share some of my ideas wow. and thoughts. To my profession, wishing you the best of, uh, best of luck. Um, it's doable. There's lots of successful practitioners. I would change your energy from complaining to just investing in yourself and making a difference um, in your life and the lives around you.
All right, awesome. So this was AJ, and I'll catch you on the next one. This has been the Acupuncturist on Fire podcast with AJ Adamchik. To continue being inspired, head over to acupuncturistonfire.com and find AJ on Instagram at acupuncturistonfire.com.